Hello and welcome to this ISSB corporate reporting webinar series, looking at how companies can start the groundwork, data gathering, the processes for ISSB reporting using tools already widely used and available for businesses and investors, in, including the SASB standards and TCFD recommendations. Today in part one of three, better information for better decisions, an introduction to investor-focused sustainability disclosure, I'm your moderator, Neil Stewart, Director of Corporate Outreach for the IFRS Foundation, and I'm joined on this webinar today by Sue Lloyd, Vice Chair of the ISSB, Jean-Paul Servet, the Chair of the International Organization of Securities Commissions, or IOSCO, and Wilhelm Mohn, Global Head of Corporate Governance for Norgus Bank Investment Management. Welcome to our webinar participants, some 6,000 registrants from 148 countries or jurisdictions, spanning uh, consultants, sustainability officers, and finance executives, investors, accounting professionals, regulators, legal professionals, and academia. In today's webinar, we're gonna give an overview of the concepts in IFRS S1, which is the ISSB's general requirements standard. And we'll talk about standardized sustainability disclosure from the perspective of the user, that is the investor, as well as regulators. Next week, we're going to turn to climate risk. And in the third week, we'll wrap up the series with a focus on integrated reporting and the processes and controls to get to investor grade sustainability disclosure. All the recordings and materials will be made available on the same web page that you're on now. Now, thanks to those of you in our audience who responded to our advanced survey, your questions really helped us to prepare. And here's how you ranked your interests in terms of content for today. So our agenda today is to hear first from Sue with a presentation on exactly these topics, and then go to a panel discussion with IOSCO and Norgus Bank, after which we'll take audience questions for Sue, Jean-Paul and Wilhelm. So please type your questions into the question box next to the video at any point. So now let's go to Sue Lloyd, Vice Chair of the ISSB, formerly Vice Chair of the IASB. Thank you very much, Neil, for, for the introduction and, and hello to everybody. So before I go into giving you some background on our general requirements document, it's good to remind us what the International Sustainability Standards Board or the IASSB is all about and what we're trying to achieve. So let's go back to the beginning. And so our role is to develop standards uh, to result in the provision of a global baseline of sustainability disclosures. So we want investors around the world to have high quality information about sustainability risks and opportunities that uh, affect companies. And we want those to be comparable um, across the globe. And I talk a lot about investors and you'll hear us talking about that during this presentation, but companies are really important to us as well. We really want to enable companies to communicate with the market, to provide their picture of how sustainability information is relevant to them when they communicate with global capital markets. And we're very interested in the efficiency and the effectiveness of that disclosure from a company perspective. And that's one of the reasons why one of the very important pieces of our work is actually working with others. We know that sustainability reporting doesn't occur in a, in a vacuum. We're not the only one who's setting requirements to do with reporting on sustainability disclosures. So a really important part of our work is working with jurisdictions and others such as GRI, the Global Reporting Initiative, to make sure that the information that we require works well with other information needs or disclosure requirements that might apply to companies so that we have a really um, well-functioning and efficient reporting system for companies and for investors. So with that background, uh, let's move on. So what are the key concepts in S1, our foundational um, document uh, that we plan to publish around the middle of this year? So this sets out the general requirements and really establishes the global baseline of reporting that we talk about at the ISSB. So the first thing that S1 does is it asks companies to provide information, material information, about all of the significant sustainability related risks and opportunities that really matter when you think about the business of the company that's reporting. We're not just asking for information on climate, but all sustainability related risks and opportunities are from a company's perspective. And I'll come back to how we um, provide that framework uh, for other topics in climate in a moment. But there's other um, important concepts in S1 that I want to touch on as well. 
The first is the importance of linkages and connections with financial statements. So S1 asks that an explanation be provided to enable investors to understand the relationship between the information in the financial statements and in the sustainability reporting, and that when possible, there be consistency of assumptions. To support that, we ask that the information in the sustainability report be provided at the same time as the financial statements. We have some transition relief on that, but ultimately the objective is that this is a package of information that's provided to investors. And we talk about where this information should be provided. We say the sustainability information that we require should be provided in the general purpose financial reporting package. We're not more specific than that. We don't say exactly where the information has to be provided because we want to be sure that if a jurisdiction has a particular location that is required, we don't contradict that. And so to facilitate global ad adoption, we say within the general reporting package, but not exactly where it has to be provided. So moving on to the next slide. So obviously a key part of what we're doing is talking about uh, sustainability. And so it's really important that we're clear what sustainability means. And so the board had an important discussion um, at, the, at the end of last year about how we describe sustainability. And the point that we want to make is that the information we want provided is to enable investors to understand that the um, performance of a company is really closely linked to how it works with and serves its stakeholders in the community, how it operates in society and the natural resources that it draws upon. What we want to do is have an explanation of how a company uh, sustainably maintains its resources and, re and relationships, how it manages its dependencies and impacts within the whole business ecosystem over the short, medium and long term. We want to enable companies to explain to investors how those sustainability related impacts, risks and opportunities can affect its long term performance and prospects. And really importantly for us from a foundation perspective, we've built on concepts in our integrated reporting framework to describe this notion of sustainability. Moving on to the next slide. Now, I'm often asked what uh, type of materiality the um, ISSB is focused on. And the first important point to say is that the information we're providing is to meet the needs of investors when they're making their investment decisions. So we're looking at financial materiality, what's important for an investor focus. And when we say that information is material, we use the same filter that is used for financial statements purposes. So in a nutshell, a piece of information has to be so important that if it was missed out, omitted, if it was misstated, or if it's obscured by other information so it isn't noticed, it could actually be reasonably expected to influence an investor decision. So this information has to be a big deal. And that's important because we want to make sure that the information provided in the ISSB sustainability reporting is really the information that is um, efficient and effective to communicate the key information to the investor market. Moving on to the next slide. Now I said I'd come back to this. S1 asks companies to provide information on all of the sustainability risks and opportunities that are important to their investors. Now, when information is provided about climate, that's going to be easy in an IESSB world in the sense that we will have a specific standard issued at the same time as S1, S2, which will set out the requirements for disclosures on climate. But what should a company do for topics beyond climate? And S1 sets out how to think about this. Firstly, when identifying what sustainability risks and opportunities to report on beyond climate, S1 will say that consideration should be given to uh, the SASB standards. So look to those and see whether there's information there that meets the information needs of your investors and apply that. And in addition, you may consider other materials, specifically the, the Climate Disclosure Standard Board Framework, uh, industry practice, and materials of other investor-focused standard setters. So that's what to report on. When you've identified the topic to provide information about, S1 then tells you how to choose the particular disclosures to provide on that topic. And there we say again, please consider the SASB standards. 
In addition, you may consider, to the extent that it meets investors' information needs, the CDSB framework, industry practice, materials of investor-focused standard setters, and in February, we will discuss whether we will also include in this list the standards of GRI and the European ESRS standards to the extent that they meet investor information needs. So importantly, there are instructions within S1 to facilitate reporting right from day one on all of the important sustainability risks and opportunities that a company's investors might need to understand. Moving on to the next slide. Now, one of the key messages that we heard when we went out with our proposals on the general requirements document and indeed on climate was it was really important to make sure that everybody had enough material to really understand what to do and to do a good job when they provide their sustainability reporting. And many made the point that sustainability reporting is very new to many stakeholders in the market and that we need to make sure that those with more limited resources and in emerging markets have the materials they need as well to support the application of our standards. And that's a request that the Foundation is taking very, very seriously. Uh, so we are thinking carefully about the educational materials and support that we need to provide ourselves and working with our partners in the market to really support the good application of our standards. And that includes thinking about the materials we need to support the application of S1. So during the re-deliberations on the S1 uh, document, there have been conversations about the materials that would help companies to, to apply the standard. Some materials will be included within S1 itself, and some will be included in educational materials that the, that the board will publish over time. So what do we know is coming up? We've said that to determine what is material, so the really important information to explain to investors, we'll make sure that there is guidance to facilitate the judgments that a company needs to make to make that assessment. When a company decides which industry it needs to provide information about, given its operations, we've said we'll provide guidance on thinking through identifying the industry specific materials that might be appropriate for a company, particularly if it's got a more complicated business model such as for conglomerates. We'll have examples that will explain how to think about the information in the financial statements that's linked to sustainability that should be provided as an explanation of the linkage between the sustainability reporting and the financial statements that I mentioned earlier. And we will provide some examples and descriptions of the sorts of materials that should be provided about things like the key judgments and estimates that a company has made in preparing its sustainability information. And this is really important because we need to be clear for investors that they understand some of the difficult choices companies may have had to make and some areas of estimation and the approaches that a company has taken so that the investor has the benefit of that context when they're looking at the sustainability reporting. So you should expect to see a lot of material from us to help those applying our new standards. Moving on to the next slide. I mentioned at the start that we're very interested in interoperability, and that's because we know that jurisdictions are very interested in sustainability reporting. And we know that um, in addition to providing information to investors, there is interest in sustainability information from other stakeholders as well. So we're working really hard to make sure that the requirements that we put in place work well with the disclosures that are asked for by others. And a really important piece of this jigsaw is the work that we're doing with jurisdictions. So we have a jurisdictional working group uh, comprised of us, the UK, uh, the US, China, Japan and Europe um, with IOSCO as observers, which is working together to ensure that the global baseline works well to meet investors' information needs and also to make sure that we have good interoperability. So that, uh, for example, if you are preparing disclosures in the US, uh, looking at the SEC's upcoming requirements or with the European requirements under ESRS, that we reduce the duplication required by companies and improve the efficiency of the reporting system. We've also made sure to work on the TCFD architecture as a basis for our standards, because that also facilitates interoperability with existing disclosure requirements. And importantly, we have a memorandum of understanding with GRI where we're looking at ensuring the maximum interoperability between our disclosure requirements and theirs, again, to facilitate efficient and effective reporting by companies around the world. Moving on to the next slide. 
So if you're listening to me now and you're wondering what you can do already to get um, prepared for applying the IFRS sustainability disclosure standards that the ISSB is going to publish, what can you do? And there's three suggestions on the slide of things that you could be thinking about already. One is looking at your existing internal systems and processes to see what information you already have on hand that could be relevant uh, to uh, provide uh, disclosures about sustainability and starting to identify gaps and thinking about how to fill those in. The second is looking at your business and thinking about what sustainability related risks and opportunities really affect the performance of your business and your long term prospects, because at the end of the day, it's those risks and opportunities that investors want information about. So looking at your governance and systems and structures to really identify your sustainability risks and opportunities is really relevant to preparing for this reporting. And last but not least, if you look at our exposure drafts and, and our re-deliberations and our supporting materials, and if you look at the work of the SASB, the CDSB framework and the TCFD recommendations, those all give you a really good idea of the disclosures that you'll be expected to provide and you can start thinking about preparing that information. So taking a little closer look at those last points, what can you do to get ahead? The first is to look at the SASB standards, to continue to use them if you already are, or even to look to freshly adopt the SASB standards. And that's a good use of time, because as I mentioned, when you apply IFRS S1, we will require companies to consider the SASB standards relevance to meet the disclosure requirements in that standard to meet investors' information needs right from the start. And why do we use the SASB standards? because of our consolidation with the Value Reporting Foundation, but more importantly, perhaps, because we know that those 77 industry-based disclosure standards provide useful information to investors that uh, supports comparability around the world, and that this is a really efficient and effective way for companies to communicate about sustainability risks and opportunities with their investors. Moving to the next slide. Another really important source document that's worth continuing to use or starting to use in preparation for using the ISSB standards is the TCFD recommendations. And why is that so relevant? It's because in S1 and indeed in our climate standard S2, we have used the TCFD recommendations as the core of the structure of those standards. So like the TCFD, we ask for the provision of information about governance, strategy, risk management and the metrics and targets about sustainability risks and opportunities. So by using the TCFD framework and building from there, that's a really good basis for preparing for the ISSB's standards. So moving to the next slide. So in summary, you already have a great toolkit at hand um, looking forward in 2023 and indeed to 2024. So looking now at 2023, um, what do you already have to hand? Uh, later this year, you'll have S1 and S2 to refer to, to prepare. And already the um, materials listed below are available. The SASB standards are already available. The TCFD uh, recommendations are available. The materials of the Climate Disclosure Standards Board and importantly, the integrated reporting framework, which explains how to think about the connection between sustainability and financial value creation. All of those materials are important and integral to the application of S1 and S2, and so they're well worthwhile referring to in 2023. Then if we look forward to 2024, S1 and S2 again will be um, available for use um, and the SASB standards will be required to be considered for the application of S1 in the absence of a specific ISSB standard. Uh, the CDSB materials, as I mentioned, will be a relevant resource to um, report on items beyond climate. And again, the integrated reporting framework is incredibly relevant because of the importance placed in S1 on the connectivity between the financial statements and broader reporting. So plenty to work with, um, even as you await for S1 and S2. Uh, Neil, with that, um, moving on to the next part of our webcast. Thank you, Sue. Uh, that was a really good overview of, of the ISSB standards, um, as well as our priorities for the coming year. I, I, I think it was a really helpful guide to how companies, as you said, can get started now, can get ahead um, using these tools that 
thousands of companies and investors around the world are already using. A lot of work has already gone into sustainability reporting. The ISSB is now evolving that, taking it to, to the next step, uh, but not starting um, with a blank sheet, really helping companies along the way. So a reminder to our live audience, uh, please type your questions into the box into, next to the video. Sue, I'll ask you to rejoin us in a few minutes to help field those audience questions. But now let's turn to our guests to get the views of uh, of regulators and investors. So I'd ask Jean-Paul and Wilhelm to join me here. Um, so uh, Jean-Paul Servet is chair of the board, the International Organization of Securities Commissions, IOSCO. He's also chair of the IFRS Foundation Monitoring Board, and besides his IOSCO responsibilities, he chairs the Belgian Financial Services and Markets Authority, FISMA. And in this capacity, he's a board member of several international supervisory bodies for the financial sector. And Wilhelm Mohn is global head of corporate governance, Norges Bank Investment Management, which manages the assets of the Norwegian government pension fund, one of the world's largest sovereign wealth funds with about $1.3 trillion under management. Uh, Wilhelm Wilhelm is also a board member for the UN Principles for Responsible Investment, or PRI. Jean-Paul, let me start with you. As we heard from Sue, we're at the cusp of standardized st sustainability disclosure. Uh, but uh, going from a patchwork of voluntary reporting to this global baseline, it, while it's a huge opportunity, is not without its challenges. So maybe you could introduce us to how IOSCO sees both the opportunity and the challenge uh, presented by uh, the ISSB and standardized disclosure. So thank you, uh, Neil, for uh, this question, which is a, a very important one. So good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone. I know that there are many people on, on the call, so congratulations for this successful event, Neil, and all your colleagues. Uh, more than 1,000 people, so it means that what you are doing is very important for many preparers, users, investors, auditors, and that we try to do in order to have a partnership with the IFRS Foundation is also, I think, uh, meaningful. Uh, and that's the reason why, as you stressed that um, some seconds ago, I will speak to you today in my capacity as chair of IOSCO. So, so just in a I would say in a nutshell, what does it mean IOSCO? Because we still have to be modest. It's not because we are working at international level that we have to think or believe that everybody knows who we are. IOSCO means, of course, in the English language, uh, International Organization of uh, Securities Commission. But it means, in other words, in fact, the Basel Committee. The Basel Committee, not located in Switzerland, but in Madrid. So what we are doing small is the same that the Basel Committee, because I think that I may say that IOSCO is recognized as the global standard setter for the security sector, product supervision, consumer protection, rule of conduct, and more generally speaking, financial market. And why do you think that it's the case? Just because I think that we are one of the few really global membership organizations uh, because, as you know, Neil, um, we are a membership organization, which means that all members are entitled in various capacity, uh, are active in the supervision of 95% of the whole financial sector all around the world. So it means 130 jurisdictions. And it means also, that's very important, that the majority of our members are, in fact, representative of the growth in emerging markets. So in other words, it means that it's the place to be. And that's the reason why, for instance, the IOSCO endorsed the famous accounting standards. And you know that one of the most important people for promoting and working of this historical accounting standards was the previous speaker. It was Sue, uh, which is my thing. I'm used to say that Sue is represent the DNA of uh, the successful story of the IFRS uh, Foundation. And that's the reason why I think that um, we can say that uh, IOSCO has to be on board. Why? Because we note that um, we know the increase in market demand for high quality sustainability disclosure. But even that, for me, more important, especially as financial supervisors, is that this exercise, this journey, because we are speaking about the journey when we speak about sustainable finance, it's a demand driven exercise. And that's for me something fascinating. Most of the time, people like me, the expectation is that we try to be intelligent, especially when you have to learn 
some lessons from our financial crisis. As such, there is not a financial crisis for the time being when we speak about sustainable finance. But the starting point is absolutely amazing because the first time in my career, maybe the last, who is the, what's the starting point of the inputs and the involvement of IOSCO and the community of financial regulators? It's not the FSB. It's not IOSCO. It's not the central bank world. It's not the financial market supervisor ecosystem. It's in fact you, ladies and gentlemen, at least in your capacity of investor. And I mean by that, John and Mary in the street. And what's the expectation of John and Mary in the street? They would like to understand in which kind of product they can invest in order to invest in companies, in product, in usage, which are in line with the expectation about sustainable finance. Yeah. And that's something fascinating. But John and Mary won't wait for us a long time. They ask to the community of supervisors to come back with one standard. They are not interested at all to work, to manage, especially as private retail investors, to work with a puzzle of different, I would say, standards. It's already the case. If you have a look on the alphabet soap of private sustainability reporting frameworks, let us be clear, I belong to the school of regulate, which thinks that there is no problem with self-regulation until the day that there is a problem with the lack of, I would say, of self-regulation, and then we have to switch to regulation. For the time being, there are many interesting, many useful initiatives, but it's a real soap of private sustainability reporting framework. And the objective via the ISSB effort is to create a global baseline. And that's what we are doing already for more than two years, because two years ago, we decided to think about a partnership with the IFRS Foundation. I, that was my opinion, especially at the time that I was vice chair before uh, being elected by my colleague, it was, it's not the job of IOSCO to be in the first line. For this, there are excellent people working, I would say, no, uh, in London, in Frankfurt, in Montreal, in Asia, so the IFRS Foundation, because we think that the objective is to have, I would say, to be ambitious and to have one global set of standards. Because people are not interested at all in having different kinds of standards at domestic regional level. And that's the reason why through our sustainable finance task force, IOSCO is currently focusing on crucial issues such as the timely delivery of high quality sustainability disclosure, mitigating, that's the negative part of the engine and storm, it's about trust, the risk of greenwashing and the sound functioning of voluntary governance. But the work, I would say, will not end here. And once the ISSB finalizes standards, and a good overview with you some minutes ago, which I understand correctly will be in the near future. What will be the job of IOSCO? We will start looking at them in detail and analyzing them against all assessment criteria in anticipation of a possible IOSCO endorsement decision through voluntary of required implementation at domestic or regional level. And such endorsement can be a catalyst for the worldwide uptake of the S1 and S2 as it was the case 20 years ago with the IFRS accounting center. And I will finish with that. In other words, the aim is to address the risk of simply moving from a current alphabet soap of private initiative to an alphabet of regulatory environment. And that's the reason why we need to work together. And that's what we are doing. Thank you, Jean-Paul. I think that was an excellent overview of the, the why and the how of IOSCO's involvement in this journey towards a global baseline. And starting, as you said, starting with that in investor demand. This is demand driven. And so it's a good point now to turn to the investor on our call, Norgus Bank Investment Management, and to ask what do investors need today? in terms of high quality sustainability information and and why why do you need it how do you use it yes uh, thank you thank you neil and uh, and hello everyone it's uh, very nice to join and uh, and i yeah i i will build on on what's what's already been been said actually by both sue and sean paul bill uh investors they need information to 
to make assessments about the uh, robustness, the long-term value creation of the companies they invest in, and uh, and sustainability is is clearly now a part of that. It is material. The question is how it's material. The other the other thing we needed we needed to be consistent and comparable and reliable and uh, against that backdrop of uh, an, an ultimate soup we need uh, the global baseline and that's really what we're supporting and why we uh, with uh, holdings in more than 70 countries we need to be able to compare uh, the companies in all those markets with one another and we need also those companies the uh, preparers to be able to report in a, in a way that's consistent and avoiding a uh, unnecessary reporting burden this is why we're so strong supporter of the ISSB, uh, providing such a global uh, baseline and really excited to see how uh, how far we've got actually since it was announced uh, in uh, COP26 that we would have ISSB. Then what do we need what do we need it for uh, more practically? Well, we use the information clearly to support our investment decisions. That could be an uh, could be a PM who plugs a piece of uh, information around emissions, for example, or, or for that matter, human capital, into their uh, fundamental analysis. Could be through our more broad-based uh, risk management, our assessment of exposures of companies and um, and their performance on risks. And then maybe building on that in our case, because we have a huge focus on stewardship, uh, finding those exposed companies with, uh, with a seemingly lack of uh, adequate management of the risks. So we've been calling for better reporting on sustainability and engaging with companies on this for, for more, more than a decade. And um, we believe that the ISSB standard will simply be a, a real game changer. Very good, Wilhelm. Thank you for that introduction. And you know, going back to Jean Paul, so we hear now the need of investors. It's very clear that investors need this data. But from the point of view of preparers, of issuers, this is a lot of work and they see sometimes this uh, reporting as, as a burden. How do you balance that need, that essential need of investors for this information with the cost uh, and the effort for preparers? Again, uh, Neil, thanks for the question, a very important one. Let us be clear, we don't have to think or believe that people like me are working in an ivory tower. Every day, I have the pleasure to discuss with people I'm supervising. I hope that they are still kicking alive after the meeting every day. So it means in my life every day, I discuss with CFO, CEO of banks, listed companies and pension funds. Everybody is able to tell me from a political point of view, how to react politically correctly. To say, of course, I am supportive of the agent that the job. But then I'm coming back to them some weeks, months and year after that, say, OK, what about the implementation? of, I would say, the financial, uh, the sustainable finance reporting. Do you think that your board of directors is on board? Do you think that your audit committee is on board? And what about, I would say, um, the timely and uh, quality of implementation? Frankly speaking, the answer is a little bit more wishy-washy at this time, because then people realize what it means. And the slide show used by law is, of course, very transparent, honest. But it means also that there is a lot of work. Let us be clear. And I think personally that it's very important that we understand the concern of the preparers and the use. I would say. So I think that this can be done to balance, I would say, useful information for decision making versus the cost. I think that this balance can be ensured in three ways. Proportionality, scalability, phasing approach and capacity building. Proportionality, or, or the new word in our world is capability, especially at the level of IFRS Foundation, correct me, Lloyd. Uh, but I think first that proportionality or scalability is important, regardless of what you call it. Because it's important to ensure that corporates at all stages of development, size and sophistication can apply the standard. But let us be clear. The big mistake would be to think that from day one, we will be perfect. That's impossible because it's about science, it's about data. I presume that Willen will tell me one of the most important aspects of my job is to find data, quality and quantity. And we know it, we know it, let us be clear. We are not, I would say, 
uh, in an avoider. So we, sh we have to be realistic and recognize that the needs, resources, preparedness of companies around the globe are not equal. But it's not only the case for sophisticated and emerging markets, but also for companies in the same region and even the same sector and even in Belgium, let us be clear. I think that's a common challenge in all parts of the globe. And companies, as well as jurisdiction, are on a journey of transition. Then also we have to explain to the investor what they will have to read, not necessarily a green balance sheet of a PNL of a cash flow state, but most of the time disclosure, or only disclosure. That's, I would say, the best way uh, uh, to, uh, to go ahead. And I think that from this point of view, proportionate application of standard can help attain the very difficult to reach balance between usefulness for investor and cost for prepared. Second way, it's about phasing approach. A second way could be by considering how standards can in some cases benefit from a phasing approach. I'm used to saying for me, the most important is that the trade starts on time, I would say, and at the same moment. But the speed and the size, the length of the trade is not necessarily the state in all jurisdictions, in all sectors, because we are all traveling in the same direction, but not necessarily at the same seat and the, the, the same size and the same length of the trade. And this, this need not to be a bad thing, as long as the direction of the travel is clear and that we don't have greenwashing. And I think that the approach that was tentatively agreed on scope three, which was not expected, let us be clear, if you have a look on the paper published by Gary Gansler and the SEC, was not necessarily expected, I would say, for you, but he was able to do that at the level of ISSB. So it means that we are going in the right direction and there are, I would say, only good students, which is important, especially, but of course, we have to be realistic. And that's the reason why I think that when we speak about scope three, to have a kind of safe harbor. And that's a good example of how allowing some temporary relief on supply chain data can ensure that the standard remains in place. Last but not least, third point is about capacity building. Not only for you, but also for us as regulators. I can tell you why the world is also changing, not only at IOSCO level, but also at Belgium level. I engage a lot of people I have a, a new team specialized in international relationship and sustainable policy in interaction with all the kind of mission statement that we have as super financial supervisor. And all of them, corporates, investors, regulators, media, observers, need to familiarize themselves with the new grammar for sustainable disclosure. And explaining the standards clearly will make sure that the disclosure are correctly understood, that there are no false expectations, and rightly integrated by investors and other stakeholders. And that's the reason why IOSCO and the ISB has already worked together in the past on capacity building initiative. There was a nice example last year in Egypt, and that's what we have to do. Very good. So proportionality, phasing in capacity building. You know, the ISSB chair, Emmanuel Faber, said uh, in Davos at the World Economic Forum last year that the ISSB would be proportionate and pragmatic. And I think uh, really uh, following those following those objectives, and as you heard from Sue, building those um, those objectives into the standards. Um, Wilhelm, going to you now, you know, uh, climate risk gets much of the attention because of the urgency. And indeed, the first requirements, uh, the first standard from the ISSB is, is a climate standard. Uh, but uh, how do you see the material impacts and the need for measurement and disclosure in other areas like human capital management, nature-based risk, which which already appear in the SASB standards, you know, from the investor lens? Yeah, this, uh, it's a great question. And I think, uh, again, as, uh, as, uh, as Sue uh, mentioned in her introduction, yes, we have uh, exposure drafts now on uh, on climate, but but yes, there is also an expectation that you report uh, all material, potential material, uh, sustainability information in the uh, in, in the S1 draft. So I think that's that's you know good to to bear in mind. And I believe again, uh, before you look at specific topics, that then the uh, industry-based standards from SASP are a very good uh, guide uh, for companies in their material materiality assessment, essentially to guide them to think about beyond climate change uh, 
uh, what type of uh, focus they should have, which uh, risks they should look more uh, keenly at and, and uh, resulting disclosure. Human capital management is, is one that we are um, focusing particularly on, not just we, but uh, certainly something we see come up more and more in our engagement with companies and also as we vote that share all the meetings and uh, through the standard setting uh, progress around the world. Why is that? Well, I think it's it's around, it's cross-cutting again, a little bit like climate change. Most companies uh, need to show to investors how they uh, manage uh, human capital, a very, very important part of their valuation, essentially, and how that supports their strategic uh, objectives. So that's the information we're looking at, and uh, SASB standards give a, a good starting point. It's hard maybe to be very prescriptive about anything to do, everything to do with uh, human capital management. There are certainly some common uh, types of disclosures, uh, metrics such as turnover and so on that, that are relevant. Nature risk, again, lots of interesting work underway. Uh, we know there is more coming from uh, ISSB. We're also very deeply involved with uh, TNFD to, to try and again understand the connections from the actual risks you see uh, to ecosystem services, uh, how they come to play for companies and companies' business models. Very good. Thanks, Wilhelm. Jean-Paul, an important question, turning the page here a little bit. You know, a number of jurisdictions have already mandated sustainability disclosure, particularly for climate risk. So already moving into rules for companies to report with or or they might be preparing to. Uh, but how, so how can we avoid preparers having to report in multiple different ways in different places? What's the regulators viewpoint on that? Yeah, thank you for your question. That's an important one because it's related to the very important issue of what we are using to call interoperability. And she already uh, mentioned that uh, in the last, uh, correct me, uh, the July slide, I think, uh, Sue. Um, and why do we have to speak about interoperability? Because I think that we have to be aware that we need to convince other good students. When it was decided, for instance, in the EU to endorse the accounting standards, I think that at this time it was the translation of a failure political level. It means that at uh, 20 years ago there was no capacity or absence of consensus between uh, European member states to upgrade the famous and a bit old fashioned accounting direct. And then we switch to uh, the ISB uh, stage. That's not the case. There are a lot of excellent initiatives in all continent. The question is how to ensure interoperability of the ISSB standards with other excellent jurisdictional initiatives and maximizing um, interoperability across the world will be an important factor in IOSCO endorsement decision and credibility. So that's the reason why we think at IOSCO level that we believe that close alignment is essential between the ISSB and those decisions to seek that seek to implement their own set of standards in order to ensure the capital flows to where it is most needed. Let us be clear. I think personally that the added value of the financial sector is not to find solutions from a technical point of view about how to fight against climate change. The objective, the main possible added value of the, of the financial step is to channel savings to project for which we could think that there is the best alignment in order to ensure cost return and fight against climate change. And therefore, if we want to ensure that capital flows are, can land when they are, they are most needed, we need to have interoperability. So there are two scenarios. Either you start from scratch, let us be clear, and that will be the case in many jurisdictions, or, like in Europe, you have your own standard, and the objective is to ensure interoperability between them and, I would say, between ISSB uh, standards. So it means, for this, by definition, it, that it goes without saying that cooperation between various standard setters is essential. And I think that I may say, as I would say, external observer, that I think that, first of all, I have to encourage the regular meeting of the jurisdictional working group. 
trying to establish a global dialogue between the ISSB and ongoing jurisdiction initiative on security. But that's the case. My reporting is that the, uh, I would say, the excellent ambience in order to exchange view, not, I would say, from a diplomatic point of view, but from a technical point of view, in order to understand each other and before the decisions are taken. Because if the objective is to discuss at length after the decision taken, ISB level versus national initiative, it's too late. And especially the case in the EU. Why do I say the EU? Because the EU was the first, I would say, a standard setter to promote new standards. And I think it was the right decision taken by the EU Commission, FRAC, and the ISSB to open this dialogue. And it was stressed in December during an FRAC conference by Commissioner McGuinness, repeated, for instance, in the last bullet of one of the slides used by SU. That's important that we are able to ensure the development of a detailed interoperability mapping exercise and table between the two set of disclosure requirements. Let us be clear, it's about trust. If we are not able to ensure, I would say, a fact-finding approach explaining that when you plug in with ISSB standards, you plug out with ESRS standard, that will be a tricky issue, but I'm sure I trust the capacity of all involved parties to be able to find such agreement, something which is, I would say, on the air, which is announced by, uh, I would say, many officials from different sides. And the objective is then uh, to have a, this, call, this so called interability mapping table between the two sets of disclosure requirements. Once, of course, the European and the international climate reporting standards are finalized, because that for sure, that's the best approach in order to avoid double reporting for companies. So avoiding double reporting is very, very important. And I think that's a very good point now to turn to the first audience question. And and Sue, you're back with us, and let me direct this one to you, uh, because from you know from what Jean Paul has been ex explaining, that the question comes in from the audience. Why should companies in the EU and the US use IFRS sustainability disclosure standards alongside adopting their local requirements? Good question. So um, the short answer is that we are designing a set of standards that's really tailored to meet um, the needs of investors. So um, a focused uh, set of information to meet investor needs. And if I think about Europe, Europe um, is very clear, given their political mandate that they are interested in investor needs, but they have broader objectives as well, including legislative objectives, which means there's a broad set of information. Within that, identifying a subset of information that's really investor focused to enable communication with the market, I think is beneficial for companies. So that's a, that's a reason to, to, to do it um, using that specific example. And then looking more generally at what the benefit is of thinking about the ISSB standards, even when you have a jurisdictional set of requirements to, to, um, to um, report to, it's that global comparability. I think it's the benefit of having a global audience where you can really give investors confidence that they know for sure that when they pick up a set of sustainability information that they're comparing like with like. That if a company looks different, it's a real sort of economic difference, if you like, not just a reporting difference. And, I, and so I think when we meet the sweet spot of looking at interoperability where a company is able to think about this ISSB's reporting and not have to duplicate, but sort of identify a, a, a portion of information that is ISSB relevant, you get efficient reporting, but the benefits of this global comparability. And I think that's, you know, something that's desirable, not just because somebody says you have to do it, but a company should choose to do that because it's a great way to communicate with the market and attract capital. So a company that's really thoughtful and how it's managing its sustainability risk and has a great transition plan should be able to communicate in a way that attracts capital. And that's what we really want to try to facilitate. Very good. So that that global baseline allowing for global comparability, but also let's look back and remember the some of the points that you made about the, the cost effectiveness, the efficiency of this reporting, the, also the inclusiveness. This is an international due process. Companies and investors have a, around the world, around the world, including in emerging markets, have a voice in it right from the beginning. Right. And uh, Jean-Paul, let me address the next one to you, and that's 
when is this coming? How fast are regulators prepared to move uh, on on ushering in this, this new era of sustainability disclosure? Yeah. So, uh, difficult question because it's about the matching between speed and quality of the decision making process and your process. But as I told you some minutes ago, John and Mary in the street won't wait uh, a very long time. So we have to be back as soon as possible. So what does it mean, in other words, uh, to go to the point? First, I think that the ISSB finalization of the standard will be, by definition, I would say, an essential milestone uh, towards the establishment of a global language for sustainable disclosure. So there will be a world before and a world after that. And it means a global language for sustainable disclosure that can replace the current alphabet soap of private disclosure. That's for ISSB. I use code, that's my job, my accountability, and of course the accountability of my colleague and friends uh, are members of the ISCO board and the Sustainable Task Force, managed by my colleague and friend from Spain, Rodrigo Cobb and Aventura. ISCO will then move fast, as I said before, um, and assess the ISSB standards against uh, our so-called agreed endorsement criteria. We are working on it for the moment in anticipation of a potential endorsement, let us be clear, giving the discretion to jurisdiction to use it for a voluntary or required um, uh, use by uh, companies, public or not. And, so. and that was, as it was in fact the case 20 years ago with the IFRS standards. And it means that IOS endorsement should be also a sudden game changer. And what does it mean, let us be clear, is that we can see from uh, what I have outlined that things are moving rapidly. I have the pleasure and the honor to be for the first time in my life in a cup. Uh, very, uh, very nice experience. I was in Sharm el Sheikh for the COP27. Let us be clear when I start to say what does it mean, IOSCO, like I did it some minutes ago, people stop me, but we know IOSCO. We know ISSB. So there are expectations. People know what we are doing and that's very impressive to see that and so that's the reason why in charmel check i also announced at the cop 27 that it expects both the disclosure and the audit standard for sustainability information to be ready for use by corporate for the end of 2024 comes. let us be clear i don't think that without deadline we can make progress it's like our private life we need to have some deadline. We need to have positive challenge. If not, we can make a long, long time. So we need challenge. And for me, my challenge is to be ready for the preparation, the audit, and the use of the 2024 accounts. And it means that we expect this report to show up as early as spring 2025. And I can only encourage preparers, but also other stakeholders. Please don't forget the user. Don't forget people are interested in that. We thought maybe being investor to start preparing and informing themselves, for instance, by listening like today uh, to this series of webinars that you are organizing. Very good, Jean-Paul. So it, it sounds like the, the message to the world of companies is that this is on its way. The, the train, as you mentioned earlier, the train is, has left the station. It's on its way. Um, and Wilhelm, to you, the question of what are your experiences expectations from smaller companies, emerging markets companies. Uh, they don't have the resources, they don't have the, uh, the, the even the availability of data. Uh, are you expecting perfection from day one? No, absolutely not. I think uh, we uh, appreciate that this is, uh, for want of a better word, a very uh, of, 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 you know, described as a journey, and we've been on that journey ourselves. Uh, we've developed our own reporting on 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 sustainability for uh, nearly 15 years. We keep keep doing things a bit differently. We also uh, keep, you know, analyzing the risks uh, of the companies we invest in differently. So, so yes, so starting uh, starting by focusing on the core data and the targets, the sort of system bits, maybe as I think Sue mentioned understanding your uh, your context your governance around it looking at uh, the guidance that's out there uh, reporting the data you're more convinced about first and then 
gradually building it. We have uh, uh, we have every understanding of that. Obviously, uh, as standards emerge and uh, we are wanting to see more and more comparable data, uh, this train will speed up, uh, as uh, Jean-Paul said. But uh, from our point of view, it's much better to start than not to start at all. Excellent, good. And Sue, let me take direct the last question to you. We've had a number of questions about materiality. Um, always people's uh, one of people's favorite subjects of, of conversation. Um, and I think a good question here that came in from the audience is that the when you talked about the the describing sustainability uh, and talked about materiality, um, you're really incorporating some of the elements, the concepts, the principles of the integrated reporting framework, wording such as resources and relationships. Um, is that intentional? What is what are some what is some of the, some of the thinking behind that? What can we expect to see come, going forward? Yeah, it's very intentional and, and it's really intentional because it's really clear that for many this is a new journey to, to use Wilhelm's term. You know, some people have done thought about sustainability reporting for a long time, but there's many sort of new entrants and people keen keen to, to get involved. And because there's different perspectives that are used when you think about sustainability, some investor focused and some, you know, full materiality or double materiality for want of a better word. You know, there's some confusion about where our work starts and stops. And what we're really keen to communicate, and one of the reasons why this description of sustainability is really important, is that it's increasingly the case that investors are interested in and things that affect companies are not limited to the effect of a sustainability risk on a company, but it's also how a company interacts with the environment, what its consequences of its actions are, that really matters to investors because it affects its reputation, it affects its license to do business um, and future cash flows. And so it's really important to us to make sure that that's clearly communicated, that people don't misunderstand that when we talk about investors or we talk about financial materiality, that we're thinking of a narrow scope of information. We're thinking about a proportionate amount of information, but it's not limited to the effects on a company how a company um, interacts with its ecosystem and its resources really does matter to investors as well. And we want to be really clear that we don't lose that perspective in our communications. Excellent. Well, Sue, thank you. And that brings us to the conclusion of part one of three of the uh, sustainability uh, corporate reporting webinar series. Um, the, I'd like to uh, remind our listeners that uh, next week in part two we'll turn to climate risk with joe allenson from salesforce and from cpp investments canada's main pension plan richard manley who is also the chair of the issb investor advisory group um, the recordings for all three parts will be here on this web page don't forget to register also on this web page and you're invited to the issb symposium on february 17th in montreal which you can join either in person or virtually Thank you very much to our speakers in part one, Sue Lloyd from the ISSB, Iosco's Jean-Paul Selve, and Wilhelm Mohn from Norgus Bank Investment Management. I'm Neil Stewart from the IFRS Foundation. Goodbye.